Now here's how this is gonna work. Uh, each of the panelists is gonna get about seven minutes to talk. And uh, so it's like 21 minutes. And I will try to keep a little bit of a clock on this. And then at the end of that, uh, let's engage in a, in a robust uh, conversation. And looking at all of you on the screen, you know, Hi. it makes me feel like I could Hi. just Did you call me laptop before? Mm, yeah, and, but it's uh, fine. And give e Ken, we can't hear you. Uh, Let's mute yourself again. Yeah. Ooh, am I unmuted now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So, Dom, you know what happened there is Dominic muted me because she probably said I was talking too long. Is that right? You were fine. Sorry. We just had a few other folks that were unmuted, and so we were trying to figure them out. But ah, so then, you see, I didn't unmute myself, but I, I, I saw that look on Carlos Fernandez's face. All I was saying is I missed you all. I wish I had you here in, my, in the living room in my office so I could give you all a hug. And I was just saying uh, it's good to see Carlos Hernandez and Cody Works working away and Anne Castle, who I have uh, known since 1981, and just so many of you who are on this screen. But we are so absolutely uh, blessed to have so many people who are supporting us, not only in Colorado, but all over the country and Canada and Mexico. And today, the panel that we have really focused in on uh, urban uh, life and ecosystems is an amazing uh, panel. So I think what I'm gonna do is introduce them separately so that I don't, I don't just introduce them at the beginning. So uh, Leticia, I'm gonna call on you first. And uh, I'm assuming she's on the screen. Um, Hello, good morning. Good. So Leticia, Leticia Gutierrez Lorandi, is a general director on policy coordination and environmental culture in the Ministry of Environment for Mexico City. She leads the planning. You know, if Joyce, if you think Fort Collins, 100,000 people, that's nothing. Uh, happy, you think uh, Denver, a couple million people planning, that's nothing. But when you got to do it for Mexico City, which I think is either the first or the second largest city in the entire earth. That's something else. Anyway, that's what she does. She leads the planning and the monitoring processes of the city's environmental policy, as well as development of its climate policy. She's uh, had 15 years of experience at both uh, the Mexican federal and state policy level, and her areas of expertise include strategic planning, policy design, and sustainable development. Please unmute yourself for one second, and let's Welcome, Leticia Gutierrez Lorandi. Bravo, bienvenida. Gracias, gracias. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I, 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 I'm allowed to share my screen uh, already. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, uh, for the Salazar, Salazar Center for this invitation. Um, I, I will begin giving you a. Uh, uh, just let me okay. please just let me know whenever you are looking at my screen uh, got it okay great great well yeah so as secretary salazar was saying mexico city is a huge and very complex city so i wanted you to first give a, a, a very a quick snapshot of Mexico City. We are the fifth economy in Latin America after Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia as countries. And we represent 17% of the country's GDP. Uh, uh, one interesting thing about Mexico City is that we're, we're not only a capital city, but we are also a city state. This, this means that our major has really the political rank of a governor since the first political constitution was approved in the Congress recently in 2016. Um, uh, one important thing about this new constitution is that it recognizes equal rights in its most, most diverse meanings, uh, and it uh, recognizes the access to a healthy environment, uh, which is one of the many rights stated in this constitution, and it has the same weight as other rights, such as the access to education, health, housing, 
uh, food. Uh, in Mexico City, we live around one fifth of the population of Mexico as a country, even though we represent only 0.08% of the total territory. Um, this is a very simple map of Mexico City where you can see uh, in a very simplified way the land use in Mexico City. And uh, a few people know that around 60% of Mexico City's territory, which is the, the green and yellow part in, in the bottom part of the map, is conservation land with natural forests, grasslands and wetlands. Uh, part of this territory and natural protected areas managed by community-owned uh, 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 forests uh, communities. Mexico City, as you uh, many of you may know, was built on a lake and a wetland system that uh, uh, used to be there in pre-Hispanic times. And since then, we have been fighting to dry our city with gray infrastructure. Um, we have serious problems of inequality, socioeconomic inequalities. Uh, only 20% of the population receives water every day. The rest have partial access to water uh, or not access uh, uh, to water at, at all. Uh, this is a picture uh, uh, where you can see informal settlements. 70% 70 70 of the poorest population have, to, have, have had to look housing outside of the urban area of Mexico City because of the lack of affordable options. And this has created a, a staggered effect of pressure on conservation land, leading to this uh, um, land use change. And of course, these settlements are most vulnerable to climate impacts. There are, in terms to access, of, of, uh, access to green areas, there are municipalities in Mexico City with, with less than two square meters per person, while in the richest areas of the city, this can be more than 16 uh, square meters per person. This is a picture of Iztapalapa municipality. Uh, this is a municipality with a population of 1.8 million people. And in some areas of this uh, um, uh, municipality of Iztapalapa, there are people who don't have access to green areas at all. In contrast, you can see here uh, Miguel Hidalgo municipality, which is one of the richest areas of Mexico City. Here, people can have access around 16 or even 20 meter, square meters per person. Uh, this is a photo of Bosque de Chapultepec, an emblematic, uh, our emblematic urban forest is like the central park of Mexico City, in the heart of the city. And uh, actually recently we won, uh, last year we won the, the gold category prize by World Urban Parks. It has an extension, extension of around 678 hectares with parts of natural forest, a very diverse cultural offer. Many of the most important museums are inside this forest. And of course, it's most of the richest people live near this, this forest. So you can see the, the, the contrast of different uh, areas and the inequalities in Mexico City. In terms of, of climate vulnerability, uh, we are exposed to, to intense rainfalls resulting in heavy, very heavy floods, as you can see in those pictures. Uh, we have a serious problem of urban, urban heat island effect that has increased due to climate change. Some, some climate models uh, that we have worked with the uh, National Autonomous University indicate and predict that Mexico City's mean temperature could increase up to four degrees Celsius by half of the century, if no action is taken. And uh, this, this uh, will be intensified in areas such as Iztapalapa, where the most, mo most uh, vulnerable communities live. In terms of water, we have uh, our, our aquifer has been historically overexploited, and we import 40% of the water that is consumed in Mexico City from distant sources. That puts the water distribution systems in a very vulnerable uh, state uh, in terms of climate impacts. Um, so with, with this context, uh, and um, uh, what I wanted to share with you today uh, uh, is uh, what we've done in terms of green infrastructure in the city. We have put uh, the concept of nature-based solution in the center of Mexico City's environment and climate policy. We have developed a green infrastructure master, master plan for Mexico City that considers four criteria to prioritize the interventions and the resources that are, are being invested in, in different projects. The first one is connectivity. The second one is accessibility for, for people, functionality and resilience. 
we have defined, uh, uh, as many of you, you may know, there are many definitions and context, context around, co concepts around green infrastructure. We have defined it as a planned and interconnected network of green, blue, and gray spaces designed and managed to offer multiple socio-environmental benefits that promote the protection of biodiversity, the improvement of existing services, adaptation to climate change, and prevention and mitigation of risks. Um, um, an example of a program uh, of this green infrastructure master plan has been the Green Challenge. This uh, Reto Verde, as we call it in Mexico City, is a goal to revegetate the city with plants and, and trees uh, up to 20 million, 20 million trees and plants. So far in one year and a half, we have reached 15 million all over the city. For this program, we have prioritized the use of native species, which has been an important challenge since there was no actual market for this massive uh, 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 challenge of planting native plants. And we had to do a complete re-engineering of the city's nurseries to produce the plants ourselves. Uh, the nurseries were producing even exotic plants for, for uh, Mexico City's biodiversity. biodiversity. Um, we have also made an effort to include pollinator gardeners in, one of, uh, in most of our green infrastructure in intervention. We have also developed uh, gardening training programs specifically aimed for women women of uh, socio uh, lower socioeconomical levels that can uh, um, use this as a, as a job. And we have trained personnel from the 13 municipalities of Mexico City in envir environmental gardening and maintenance of these spaces. Um, here you can see uh, uh, um, examples of revegetations that we did in main avenues, streets, and small parks all over the city. You can see there are some emblematic ave avenues with pollinator gardens, such as Chapultepec Avenue, Tlalpan Avenue, and a new linear park in periphery, uh, Periférico Poniente, which used to be a, a, a concrete, no, no more than concrete. Um, this is another example I, I, I like a lot. We have um, um, uh, in total rehabilitated 22 public spaces as new parks with green infrastructure. This case in particular is Parque Cuitlahuac. This is a park in Iztapalapa, this municipality I was showing you at the beginning of the presentation, with 40 hectares that have been rehabilitated. The park was built in an old garbage dump. Uh, it is located in this municipality, which I pointed out at the beginning of my presentation, that has a, a very little access a, a for people to green spaces. So, right, so now they have 40 hectares there in the middle of the municipality where there used to be a garbage dump. This is another uh, example of a new park in a reclaimed space that belonged to uh, an asphalt plant in Mexico City that was a hazard also for the health of the inhabitants of, of those uh, areas. The new park has 2.6 hectares and it also includes uh, infiltration gardens and, and pollinator gardens. Um, here you can see some photos of Sierra de Santa Catarina, which is also in the east part of the city, one of the poorest parts of the city. We have, with this one, we have uh, intervened 25 natural protected areas in Mexico City. Uh, with a focus on restoration and reforestation activities, activities but also uh, uh, something that we call social rehabilitation, which means that uh, we open them to the public because they used to be closed and fenced, and uh, we included urban infrastructure, main services, and uh, other projects such as that pollinator garden you can see there. Um, this is another example of a natural protected area that was closed to the people. Uh, um, in Xochimilco Ecological Park is a rehabilitation of 165 hectares and, and it was not accessible to people. People had to pay to get inside and it was fenced. Canal Nacional is another nice example of a linear park. This used to be a, an emblematic pre-Hispanic canal back in Tenochtitlan. 
uh, before the, the uh, Spaniard conquest. And it has been rehabilitated with slope stabilization, water sanitization, and it will be converted in a linear, in linear, linear park open to people, and it will cross five municipalities of Mexico City and connect them. It, it, it used to be also a, a fence along both sides of the canal. Um, and finally, this is another example I wanted to share with you. This is a, a Aragon forest. This is an urban forest that uh, is, it is located in the east part of the city next to impo imp impoverished neighborhoods and, and, and we did an intervention of, of 106, Perfect. yes. Uh, we did. We didn't. I, I'm just about to, to finish. I, I don't know if that was a, a signal for the time. I'm just. No, about to no. Finish. I think it was just somebody who helped. Who oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we did an intervention here of 160 hectares, uh, and we constructed this. Uh, we call it a, a urban wetland, and uh, um, it's not natural. It's artificial. Uh, an artificial. Uh, wetland uh, uh, also for water treatment to give maintenance to the existing uh, natural wetland that is there that it's around 600 uh, uh, 6,000 uh, square meters uh, uh, since the rehabilitation of those uh, wetlands we have received a lot of uh, uh, bird uh, birds uh, in, in migration birds uh, in this part of the city so just as a conclusion, I, I would like to point out that this, this is only a, a snapshot of, of, of the of, uh, projects that we have been done uh, um, in the city, in streets, in avenues, urban parks, natural protected areas. This is a picture of Xochimilco. Maybe some of you know this uh, traditional Chinampa system of floating uh, um, uh, pieces of land that are called Chinampas in Mexico City that we have done also a, a, um, an important job there to rehabilitate uh, uh, that uh, production system. And I wanted to point, it, to point out that we recognize in Mexico City that um, uh, nature-based solutions in, in the context of urban development uh, uh, help to conserve biodiversity and urban biodiversity is, is very important to bring connectivity from the most natural areas to the most urban areas. Climate change adaptation for ecosystems are, and for communities, flood reduction, run of control and drain management, job creation, green job creation, especially for young uh, uh, men and women, it increases the economic value of spaces and it gives the people the chance to reconnect with nature and value nature uh, because we're opening spaces where there were not that there was not that uh, there were not that accessible and provides a better healthy quality of life uh, for people and especially in Mexico City where we have a very unequal society so uh, that's it. That was what, that's what's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia. That was, uh, that was really wonderful. And uh, uh, I won't have everybody unmute themselves yet, but let me, on everybody's behalf, give you a round of <laughs> a wonderful presentation. Working in such complex conditions and already coming in a whole host of questions such as, uh, are each of the projects you outlined part of a citywide plan? Uh, how are they funded? Because funding is always obviously a big issue. And uh, most recently is wastewater uh, funding, uh, the wastewater treatment or program funding some of these improvements. So just keep those uh, questions and we'll have an opportunity for some more questions. And now if I can um, see Allegra Happy Haynes, um, getting my whole screen back on. I'm learning how to do this, Dominic, you know. So uh, I want to just say a couple words in the introduction of uh, Happy Haynes. So from Mexico City, all the way here to the city and county of Denver and uh, the Haynes family has been, I think, uh, one of the century contributors to what the city and county of Denver is today. And uh, Happy's uh, leadership on so many issues, on environmental issues, on uh, civil rights, 
and equal justice issues, racial reform issues, is a voice that rings uh, from one end of the city to another, uh, working closely with Michael Hancock and his team. And so it's my honor to introduce my wonderful friend, Happy Haynes. If you'll all meet, unmute yourself for a minute, uh, everybody unmute themselves, make this a little bit more lively. Uh, Marty Zeller, I see you there, Rio de la Vista down in the San Luis Valley. Come on, unmute yourselves, unmute yourselves. Mm -hmm. them unmute yourselves to get a little bit of blood flowing. Hello. Okay. Hi. Happy. A round of applause. Hi, happy. 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 Bring it over to Happy Haynes. Thank you so much. Uh, and greetings to you, my dear friend, Secretary Salazar, and to all of you. Uh, I, am a, I am so excited to share the platform with these dynamic leaders in conservation and to share a little bit about our journey in Denver towards an equitable, inclusive, and resilient city using an integrated and multidisciplinary approach. Now, uh, I'm going to test my skills here. I think this is the one. Hmm. All right. I hope this isn't my notes page, but we'll. Great. I'm trying to figure out how to change this. Lower right hand side, happy. Ah, got it. I start with an important milestone in our journey. The game plan for a healthy city is a 20 year strategic plan for Denver Parks and Recreation and was created as part of a collaborative planning process with several other city agencies called Denver Right. Together, these agencies identified six pillars to represent our shared vision of Denver's future. These pillars are interdependent. An environmentally resilient city can't happen without a commitment to equitable, affordable, and inclusive communities. Before I share a few projects and initiatives that illustrate our resiliency efforts and challenges, I want to highlight three important principles that guide our work in Denver. Data is the most important tool we use to guide and inform our work to identify needs and opportunities. Equity is the value that drives our decision making and priorities. And community engagement defines how we do the work and how we engage the community in designing and co-creating solutions. With this equity map, park and resiliency planners prioritize projects and target capital investment based on the overall equity score or individual indicators. Coupled with the department's asset condition assessment, Denver Parks and Recreation now takes an equity focused data driven approach in our annual budget planning. Other agencies in the city have created similar equity maps that often share common data characteristics. In Parks and Recreation, we have matched key socioeconomic factors to parks-related factors. When it comes to defining gaps in service and priority needs, most of these different maps identify the same areas of town, often referred to as the banana or the L. It is a common saying in historically marginalized communities that if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. The truth of that statement is reflected in countless ways in our cities, from the disproportionate impacts of industry and pollution in low income and communities of color, to the historic underinvestment in housing, parks, infrastructure, and amenities. That is why a critical component of creating truly equitable solutions is to ensure that community members have that seat at the table. The platform project pictured here is a, a great illustration of this principle. The platform open space is situated in one of the most underserved areas of Denver, 
near a, a former Superfund site. The community identified the site, created the partnership, and identified funding to help build the new native open space. I mentioned earlier that many of our data mapping efforts overlap significantly when it comes to identifying equity needs and priorities. Here is an excellent example borrowed from our environmental health agency. In this heat vulnerability map, you can clearly see the orange and red areas, the banana or the L that defines the traditionally underserved areas of our city. In our map, the light green areas um, that identify low tree canopy align remarkably with the red dots indicating heat islands. We have 2.2 million trees that make up Denver's urban tree canopy, a long way from Mexico City, but they're ours. Uh, and Denver Parks manages 13% of that canopy. Just this small portion provides $23 million in biophysical benefits, such as air quality, energy savings, and storm water management. So Congresswoman Hallen planting trees is music to my ears. Our Urban Tree Initiative has a focus on equity and relies on partnerships with nonprofit groups that help us plant over 5,000 trees annually. We have preemptively treated thousands of street trees and replaced thousands more to combat the emerald ash borer that we know is coming. The multiple benefits of urban tree canopy just demonstrate the interdependent and cross-disciplinary nature of resiliency planning and building sustainable communities. The next project I'd like to highlight is the Platte to Park Hill, or we fondly refer to as the P2P project. Here you see the three largest drainage basins in Denver flowing towards the South Platte River, and not surprisingly, the greatest impacts and risks affect underserved communities. The circles represent the four projects with this 298 million multi-agency project that is soon to be completed. The photo taken uh, in, in this uh, picture, it was taken in a community near the number two circle, which routinely experiences all the storm flow from the upstream areas. This flood represented only a 10 or 15 year storm. So the three projects highlighted here will manage 100 year storm capacity in these basins. And at the same time, they have created a new one mile greenway and rebuilt and enhanced a community park and an historic golf course, benefiting, benefiting both parks and recreation and community residents. This is a closer illustration of the new one mile greenway in an area that was previously considered a park desert using the Trust for Public Lands 10 minute walk roll standard. The last project I'll feature is another water project. We are after all in the Southwest where water is king. The River Vision Plan seeks to restore the health, economic and recreational value of the South Platte River through city projects, Army Corps, and other private development partnerships. In the top photo, the Carpio Sanguinetti Heron Pond Park Project realigns the Globeville Levee to increase the buffer along the river for future improvements and incorporates a water quality feature that treats over 700 acres of tributary area prior to entering the river. In the section shown at the bottom of the slide, Urban Waterways is an ambitious project working with the Army Corps and many other organizations to restore the riparian and wetland habitat of the South Platte River and enhance flood management. The National Western Complex hosts the largest stock show and rodeo in the country. This $1 billion redevelopment 
will relocate sanitary pipes on the riverbank to restore the river and adjacent wetlands and create a new park space. The project also addresses climate change through a heat exchange program that uses both sewer heat recovery and a district energy approach. Using this system, the 250 acre campus will avoid emitting an estimated 2,600 metric tons of carbon annually, along with the ecological benefits I already mentioned. This presentation has focused a lot today on our green and open space efforts that support resiliency. But Denver does so much more, such as adding new bike lanes to our streets, installing solar power on our buildings, improving outcomes for children, and increasing affordable housing. Recognizing the need for an equity-driven, comprehensive plan under a unified set of principles, we are collaborating with the city's new Office of Climate Action, Sustainability, and Resiliency to create a citywide resiliency plan. And we are excited that the Salazar Center will play a key role in this effort as part of the partnership that President McConnell announced earlier today. You know, no one could have predicted the sudden upheaval that COVID has caused. But we absolutely know that the challenges created by climate change and a growing city can be addressed effectively if we take the time now to harness our collective power to create lasting change. I'm really looking forward to this collaboration between so many agencies, and I look forward to reporting our progress at next year's symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, happy Haynes. Uh, as always, a uh, wonderful presentation and Denver as vibrant as it is uh, having uh, so many, so many activities underway. Um, can uh, the host bring me back so I can see everybody? Dominic, can you get everybody back on? You should still be there. You might need to change your own view, but we're, uh, all, we're all here. <laughs> ah, there you are. Now we're happy again. <laughs> so uh, first of all, can you please unmute your screens? Now, now I think I'm unmuted and I can see you. So uh, happy. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Let's give her a round of applause. Thanks, Happy. Keep going, happy, keep going. <laughs> Question for you to keep in the back of your head. So Denver's only a very small part of the Denver metro area. What's wrong? How do you take this concept beyond that? And you, we can, there'll be other questions when we get to the Q&A period. But now it is uh, my honor to introduce uh, Sadhu Johnston, who is a city manager for Vancouver, British Columbia, working to make his city an even more vibrant and sustainable community through programs such as the citywide compost collection, public bike, bike share, water conservation programs, and green job strategies. Prior, he served to as a city of Chicago, as a city, as a chief environmental officer there, and he was responsible for the oversight of the environmental initiatives, including the first climate action plan, Sadhu. Can you please unmute yourselves for one second? And let's give Sadhu a round of applause. Welcome. Okay. All right, all yours. Great, thank you. You can hear me okay? Are you, am I coming across all right? Okay, great. Well, greetings from Vancouver. I wanna start um, by saying um, and recognizing that I am speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. They are the three First Nations bands whose territory that we reside on and uh, for which no, no treaties have been signed. Uh, so this is uh, an ongoing uh, um, opportunity for us for reconciliation. 
I want to acknowledge that. I also want to connect uh, personally with all of you in the Colorado and uh, Denver area. I went to elementary school and high school in Boulder. So I'm, I feel uh, a connection to all of you and certainly a connection to Colorado, as, even though it feels very far away here in our temperate rainforest in Vancouver. So thanks for having me, uh, Beth. Uh, great to uh, see you and connect again. Thanks for reaching out. I'm gonna try to share my screen here, um, see if I can pull this off. Let me know if uh, you get a chance to uh, connect here. Is that showing up for you? You seeing a photo of the uh, downtown? Great. Oh, good. Okay, thanks. So um, what I'd like to do today is uh, really tell you a specific story about uh, Vancouver and um, our journey as a, uh, as a city um, both of reconciliation um, with our First Nations, but also of reconciliation with nature. This is, uh, this is our downtown. We're one municipality in a region. Our region is about two point, uh, over two million people. Our, uh, our city, which is what you see here, is just about 650,000 people. So we are one community in a, uh, in a larger municip municipal region. So um, let's see if I can change my slides here. So uh, pre-1850s, this was, this was the area that we now know as Vancouver, and our indigenous communities lived here for thousands of years, as, uh, as has been identified earlier, uh, living with and on the land, um, to uh, many extents in, in harmony. And um, it was in uh, the 1850s that uh, co colonialization started. And uh, one of the primary uh, First Nations communities that was in Vancouver is known as the Sanak, the Squamish. And uh, their, their village was known as Sanak. In 1891 here, you can see, in 1936, uh, just a few years later, this was the same area. And as you can see, industrial development took over. Um, this community was forcibly removed from their reserve. Uh, they were firstly put onto reserves and then forcibly removed from the reserve and displaced uh, in order to allow for industrial development. And that industrial development um, really just trashed the area. Here we are in 1936. I mean, you can see this is, this is the same area as I showed you a moment ago. This is effectively downtown Vancouver. And um, not only were our um, indigenous communities displaced, but uh, as you can see, there was very considerable um, industrial development. So by the time the 70s came around, the, uh, the whole South Shore of False Creek was pretty much a super fun site. And um, very, very considerable contamination and um, in many ways an industrial wasteland. The waters were trashed, the land was polluted, and as a community we were asking ourselves how do we take from what's on the left um, the industry and create a community and that's that's really what the city endeavored to do from the 70s and 80s, building affordable housing, restoring habitat, and so the story really is about um, concerted effort over many years. This is that area now. Um, where in the, some industry has been kept. Um, we, we, you see here art on our uh, concrete plant that remains in those waters that I showed you photos of a few minutes ago. Meanwhile, um, parks have been built and habitats have been restored. Industrial hulks and legacies have been renewed for public markets and for art. And uh, as you can see, people um, in those waters that we still are challenged to clean up. So a lot of work happened to try to restore that, that, those waters for many, many years. Um, often, uh, as you can see, building uh, walkable communities with uh, bike paths, pedestrian paths, and trying to bring back habitat for the wildlife that used to flourish in these areas. And that, that development has um, taken place around False Creek, the area that, uh, that the uh, First Nations lived in primarily here. In, in, our, in our attempts to develop this area, we have tried to do it in a sustainable way. This is a photo under our bridge of our sewer uh, waste plant. Um, we take the heat from the sewer and we sequester that heat, which uh, you just heard about as Denver is undertaking. And uh, we use that heat to heat the entire neighborhood. And this public art 
uh, is uh, meant to depict a hand. And um, the fingernails on the hand there uh, change color as uh, more energy is being used in the neighborhood. So if you live in this neighborhood, your greenhouse gas emissions are about 70% less because you're heating your hot water in your home with the waste heat from the sewers. So there are uh, opportunities to um, rebuild in a, in a more sustainable way. And this is part of our Greenest City Action Plan. What we've realized more recently is, is that the, the, the legacy of the First Nations that lived here and that still live here has been largely ignored for many years. And so we declared our city as the city of reconciliation in 2015 and set upon a journey to really explore what it meant, what it means to live um, as a city of reconciliation and bring equity back into our community and uh, develop our community, build our community and, and uh, run it in a way that is in harmony both with the First Nations but with, uh, with nature. And that's been a, a journey for us that has, uh, has um, really involve changing how we um, operate our city and recognizing that our city is built on colonial structures uh, of repression and racism. And that's, uh, that is very difficult for, for us as a community to acknowledge, but it's uh, set us on a course to explore how to change that. And uh, we did a reconciliation march a few years ago with 70,000 people on this journey with us. So being a city of reconciliation has also changed how we build our parks, how we build our green spaces, how we build our community to recognize that legacy, to work with the First Nations that are here, the three First Nations, but also with our urban indigenous community. So our uh, city of reconciliation work is, is uh, asking many questions for us as we continue to evolve as a community and um, really many wounds that need to be, need to be healed. As we, um, as we continued on this, this journey, we're also recognizing that things are changing and we're f finding ways to acknowledge that and plan for it. Sea level rise could have a major impact on our community. So this, this public art that you see here acknowledges the levels of the sea level rise will take in our, in our community and uh, over the years and went along with, uh, with the an education program to help our, our community to understand the implications of sea level rise. So that's uh, that, that figuring out how to use the work that we're doing to communicate with, with the public about the changes that are coming and what was here and what can be here, what we can collectively do together. As a part of that, this is a, a film that was produced and hundreds of thousands of people saw it and it was projected underneath the bridge on those waters to talk about, to communicate the story of the salmon, what the salmon that were here and that we, we hope to bring back one day through our work of bringing urban habitat back to the community. So as a part of our, our work redeveloping this community, uh, you see on the bottom left of the slide, Habitat Island, we really, really focused on trying to bring herring back and in the way that we do uh, clean up these waters. And so uh, a lot of herring habitat work went into our, our work there. You can see uh, the riprap as well as the, the gravel that was brought in, people enjoying Habitat Island. And uh, it's, it's been very, very, very well received and taught us a lot about how to bring back na natural habitat to um, these very urban areas. And uh, it worked. Herring have come back and um, with the herring, you see the seals. And uh, so we're, we're seeing in what was not that long ago, a, a pretty toxic area, uh, wildlife coming back. And um, it's pretty amazing that uh, the, the herring habitat brought the herring and the herring brought the seals and the seals brought the orca whales. And so uh, for the first time in over a hundred years, we had um, the last couple of years is 2019, we had orca whales coming back into our waters in downtown Vancouver. And so I really, I wanted to tell you this story just because it's, it, you know, it feels like these things take so long, but with a concerted effort, we can, we really can make a difference. We can bring back wildlife into our communities and support them. And meanwhile, we, we need to recognize that these, these areas are changing. A lot is changing and we need to do more to reduce our carbon emissions as we are with the district energy and many other initiatives. But uh, through our adaptation planning, we need to really recognize that we need to continue to adapt our community and be ready for the changes that are coming. So I guess I want to close out with just a, a simple image here to say, 
that uh, you know we often um, overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in five or ten. And uh, so here um, is is the image of that area over uh, the last 20 years, a very, very fundamental changes in downtown. So we can bring nature back to our cities. Um, Vancouver, we've got a biodiversity strategy, a bird friendly strategy, an urban forest strategy, and all of those pieces tying together, I think we can have a considerable impact to take on the challenges of bringing nature back to our cities, but also of, uh, of, of reconciliation. So thanks very much and happy to participate in uh, the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Sadhu. So uh, let me uh, ask uh, Leticia and Happy to also unmute themselves so that I can uh, ask a question. And we are now at uh, 10, 16, so we have about 14 minutes. I want to ask, looking through the chat, just some of the questions that have come in. And I think some of it was based off on Leticia's opening comment uh, on what they're doing in Mexico City with uh, that huge population where the criteria on projects are connectivity, accessibility, functionality, and resilience. Uh, you all are doing that in some way, but I want you, uh, Sadhu, and happy to also reflect on that concept. I want also if uh, three of you would reflect on funding because uh, these things are expensive. They don't happen by themselves. And so funding, uh, how do you, bring the funding together may not happen in one year, as you were saying, Sadhu, may happen in five years or 20 years, but how do you do that? And then thirdly, uh, how do you go beyond the political jurisdictions of uh, the boundaries of your cities? You are, Leticia, you are responsible for the state and the city, uh, but there are multiple jurisdictions. So how do you make sure that that happens? Same thing here in Denver, happy where you have Adams County downstream, Jefferson County upstream, et cetera. How do, you, how do you go beyond your borders? How do you go beyond, beyond your borders? Uh, so maybe let's uh, go out in reverse order in which you spoke uh, just on that question and then we'll bring some other questions in. So uh, Sadhu, if you take a couple minutes and go first and then we'll go to Leticia and then to Happy. Thanks, yeah. Um, the, uh... Maybe I'll focus on the funding challenge uh, first. Um, you know, firstly, I think uh, we need to try to find ways to bring these approaches into all of the work that we do rather than having this be um, additional costs that we layer on. So if we're, if we're uh, developers doing a development, how do we get them to um, really bring in ecological design as a foundation of their work? If we're redoing a road, how do we build that road in a way that it absorbs the stormwater, puts it into rain gardens? So really what we're trying to do rather than looking at additional costs is looking at, well, what are we spending and how do we use that more efficiently? How do we achieve multiple objectives with our investments? There are times when things may cost more and, that, and uh, we may need to acknowledge that that's, what we, that's the right thing to do. But fundamentally, I think there are opportunities to really integrate this approach into all of the work that we do, into the work that we do as regulators, as owners of land, as uh, owners of infrastructure. So I think that's the fundamental approach that I would really encourage us to take is, is, and also to recognize that there are savings. You know, if we spend a little bit more on electric vehicle now or an LED light or a, a, a green infrastructure that absorbs the stormwater, each of those things have paybacks. They have savings. They may come in five years or 10 years or 20 years, but ultimately um, doing this can, can actually save us money and, and to really take a longer term perspective rather than thinking about it just as that initial, initial cost. So Leticia, to you, same question and a little supplemental footnote question. How do you navigate these funding issues as you move from one political administration to a second or third as you have in Mexico City? Um. So um, we are living a historic moment in Mexico City because we are the first government under this new constitution. So it's the first time in history we have a governor and 13 mayors. And uh, it has played out very positively because 12 out of 13 of those uh, mayors are from the same political party. So uh, it has been a very favorable 
political environment in which we are working hand in hand and um, actually the allocation of budget from the central government, no, the Jefatura de Gobierno of Mexico City to the municipalities was done in a very transparent way, um, uh, different from other administration, administration, and that has also favored the, the, the disposition of the different uh, majors to work along uh, 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 our city. So um, uh, maybe in the years to come, it will be a challenge. Uh, actually, next year, uh, there will be elections in the Congress and, and, and in and re-election in some of the municipalities. So we'll see, no, but right, right now it has been a very, very favorable a, a political uh, situation. In terms of the budget, we have, um, a, I think the point here, especially for a green infrastructure, is to realize that the budget will not come from, from the environment sector. Uh, to give you an idea, in, in Mexico City Ministry of Environment, we have around one third of the budget that uh, the Ministry for Public's work, Public Works has. And um, and the water system budget budget is around four times more uh, the budget we have in the Ministry of Environment. So many of these uh, uh, projects that I showed you in my presentation have been financed by the Ministry of Public Works and the Ministry that the, the uh, Sistema de Aguas de la Ciudad de México. Uh, and and our role as the Ministry of Environment is to provide the regulations, the the, the criteria, the, you know, the the principles the indicators and to navigate and to coordinate in order for, for that infrastructure, that green infrastructure with, with nature in the certain center can happen. No? And, and that of course is very challenging no? uh, because uh, whoever has the money decides. No? But well, the, the, the good news is that that money is being spent on, on, on green infrastructure and with the vision that we want uh, in the city. And also it helps a lot that the, that the chief of government uh, uh, Mrs. Claud Claudia Sheinbaum, she's an environmentalist. So we have the most, uh, at the most uh, uh, high political level, the, the commitment for, for doing these kind of projects. Thank you very much, Leticia. Happy? Uh, Ken, uh, a great question. And, um, you know, the projects that, uh, that I highlighted um, um, were accomplished with what we like fondly call OPM, other people's money. Um, and that has happened because uh, in our city now, we are looking at parks and open spaces as integral um, infrastructure to the city. And that, that wasn't always the case. Parks were seen as nice to haves. But people recognize parks and open spaces as integral in infrastructure in our communities and important to addressing the resiliency and sustainability challenges that we face. Secondly, um, as said, you mentioned, um, and as uh, conservation organizations around the world have also discovered, we can't buy our way to the outcomes that we want uh, for our cities. Uh, funding is important, but it, it is more important to change the way we do things, to change the way we do business to incorporate the outcomes that we seek as a part of the way uh, we um, that we plan our cities, and so that engages our private sector, uh, our private community, our development community, and yes, our residents. Uh, for example, in Denver, recently stepped up and passed an additional sales tax uh, levy to help support our parks and open spaces. So it is, it's certainly a multifaceted uh, approach that's really important. And, I, and I, Ken, I'll answer the question about the metro area as a part of this, because uh, we can't do it alone. Denver does not exist in a bubble. Um, if, if as environmental organizations, we know nothing else, as city builders, we know nothing else, um, it, it involves the larger community, larger metropolitan area of Denver. And I think I understated in the projects that I was trying to quickly share how many of those uh, rely on our partnerships with our adjoining jurisdictions, uh, particularly along our shared uh, waterways. Uh, and uh, in, as we look at the tree canopy, um, it, it involves our neighbors on every side of our city. Thank you very much, Happy, for and all of you for those wonderful comments. Now, uh, 
Patrick Phillips, I'm going to call on you because I would like you to try, you have such a history in terms of working on Great America Parks, on urban parks, on urban planning through the Institute. I want you to synthesize what you heard from uh, our three wonderful speakers, and uh, then we'll come back to our speakers. So uh, take a couple minutes, Patrick. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, this um, wasn't even said... rehearsed. It wasn't even in the notes. So this is just calling, uh, you know, let's see what comes off the top of his head. That's right. This is being called put on the spot, I think, right? Uh, Mr. Secretary, and thanks to all of our speakers. I thought it was a wonderful series of presentations. Um, I guess what I would uh, zero in on is, uh, is you know, obviously I think the, the critical importance of the natural environment and the integration of the natural environment with, with our, uh, our, our human patterns is, is, uh, is uh, interwoven throughout each of the presentations. I, I think what I heard was a very pragmatic uh, set of initiatives uh, that uh, aim to produce meaningful, tangible, measurable outcomes uh, for neighborhoods and uh, for neighborhoods. I, you know, equity um, and access to these resources was clearly recognized by each of our speakers. Uh, I think that the funding and the regionalism uh, comments that uh, that uh, were made both for, for Vancouver and, and Mexico City as well as for Denver, critically important. You know, Denver has um, a long-standing reputation for thinking regionally and, and thinking long-term. Um, uh, to see more uh, jurisdictions across sort of the United States work together with their surrounding uh, areas to, to craft and implement regional solutions. It's, it's the exception, unfortunately, rather than the rule. Uh, but Denver has a good track record of that, and particularly when it comes to funding these initiatives. You know, a small slice of a very large economic base uh, is, is, I think, the way to, to, uh, to think about how we fund these things. I love uh, the statement from Vancouver about not necessarily seeking or thinking about this in terms of new funding, but making uh, a better use of the resources that we have, and better choices. My friend uh, Tom Murphy, the former mayor of Pittsburgh, is, uh, is uh, very strong on this point, that uh, when, when you hear someone say, well, afford that, uh, he, he's, he's very quick to point out, it's simply a matter of setting the right priorities. So uh, I, I commend each of our, of our speakers the uh, um, intriguing uh, uh, opportunities to continue to reconcile uh, the needs of the human settlements with the, the natural systems. Um, they're doing great work, and, and I think, you know, it, it, as we've talked about, the, the role of the Salazar Center is to, uh, in part, uh, amplify and illuminate these initiatives uh, from, uh, from cities around the uh, the continent uh, to demonstrate, as we did at the Urban Land Institute, best practices uh, for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I'm going to call on Tom Goujon to reflect on your comments and uh, also to reflect on the presentations here. What struck me, uh, Tom, is that uh, there's the before and the after, right? So you look at Vancouver, so do those uh, pictures that you showed on the, uh, the urban devastation, if you will, before the initiatives that have taken place. Leticia, Mexico City, the beginning of your pictures and then showing the success you've had there. Happy, the same thing with you from a uh, South Platte that was abandoned to the great projects you have going on there. So Tom Bujan, uh, what's your perception? You've been around these issues for a long time in terms of how far we have come and uh, as importantly, how much more do we have to do? Thanks, Ken. I, I didn't see me raise my hand, but I appreciate your calling on me. Uh, <laughs> I, I said a note to the chat, you know, I, I was struck. I mean, as someone who was educated in, you know, in urban planning back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, just just how far we've come and what we what we think about and what our expectations should be for urban environments. You know, I, integration of nature was very little referenced back, you know, in that era and um, equity was not a conversation anyone had, you know, and so to think about how far the norms of, you know, of, of planning have come and the expectations of, you know, I think we just accepted that there was a lot of degradation that came with 
um, with urbanism. And, you know, and now I think that assumption is, is been turned on its head, you know, that there's no reason why, in fact, the people who've suffered all the worst consequences of that, you know, deserve the most effort and attention now. And I think all these presentations showed how in different ways that's, that's starting to happen. So, you know, as Sadhu said, you know, in a year or two, it doesn't feel like much happens. And you think what happens in 30 years, a lot can change. So let me just uh, reflect that Tom Gujan some uh, 30 years ago uh, gave me the favorite phrase that I've used uh, all over the world, and that's the joy is in the journey. And uh, the joy is in the journey and all of the things we're doing here at the CSU Salazar Center for, for North American Conservation. And it is uh, the joy in the journey in each of these projects uh, and initiatives in Vancouver, uh, Denver and Mexico City, and in so many hundreds and, and probably thousands of cities uh, all around the world. So if you can all unmute yourself, uh, let us uh, all join together and uh, thank Leticia, Happy Haynes, and Sadhu Johnson, and all the participants for a wonderful panel this morning.